So our next speaker is Tony um, Edgen from Cyverse, uh, and his talk is titled 10 Years at Cyverse, Some IRIS Administration Practices. Good morning. Um, as you can see, I changed the name of my talk. I, I changed my mind a lot. I'm sorry about that. So I've been working with IRODs for a little over 10 years, and I've been managing the data store for Cybers for eight of them. During that time, I've used IRODs, well, leveraged IRODs extensively to um, grow our uh, the data store. Um, in doing that, though, I mean, I spent uh, countless hours well, heavily used IRODs chat, spent countless hours uh, reading through the documentation, um, searching the internet, even reading through the code, spent uh, countless more hours uh, doing testing, just trial and error te based testing on the configuring IRODs to see what works and what doesn't work, or what I should say, what to do and what not to do. So doing all that, I learned one important thing. IRODs is hard. So, or more precisely, IROD is powerful. It's difficult to master. It's got lots and lots of features, um, and it's they've only grown since in the last well since I've known it. Uh, and it's along with these features, though, uh, due to the small team size of its creators, it's sparse and incomplete documentation and a few online tutorials, which all that's in, all that's improving. But another thing that came out of this was that sharing knowledge within the community is important for using it effectively. And so the, during this talk, I'm gonna go over three things. First, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Cyverse Data Store. Then I'm gonna go over a few solutions I've come up with for solving some problems we've had, like uh, service accounts, uh, determining where uh, data should go when it gets up uploaded, and uh, downloading large sets of small files. And finally, I'm gonna propose an IROD's administration interest group. So here's a component diagram of the data store. So it's grown in time for uh, basically just being IROD's to adding features, adding support based on the needs of our users and our own pain from uh, dealing with lots of users. So it's not shown here, but we've, uh, we've created done things like created a, a Go commands, which is a Go library, well, Go version, excuse me, limited version of I commands written in Go. It's more portable and can be run on more operating systems than I, can, I commands can at the moment. Uh, Il Young Choi will be talking more about that later on. Also, um, add, it's also grown, added support for more protocols like SFTP and WebDAV. We, we used, um, wrote, Il Young also wrote, um, uh, IROD's plugin for SFTP Go service that so now you can present IROD's as SFTP. And we make use of DAVROD's, which came out of Utrecht, and to provide a web DAV service, which we backed with a varnish cache for uh, fast access. Uh, we've also added a message publishing to it. And uh, we, so any, excuse me, event publishing. So anytime things happen in the data store, publishes events for other internal cyber services, one of which is called Data Watch, which present, makes these events available for external services, which they can subscribe through through web hooks. Oh, excuse me, can subscribe through and web hook and provide a web hook, which will be called and they can get information about data changes. Um, let's see, so all this has been driven by use, our new users' needs and I don't have my notes in front of me. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. So here's an overview of, well, our IRAD zone by the numbers. It's not the, the largest zone out there, but it, it, it is one of the, probably one of the most complex because we have over 4,000 lines of policy and we connect to a lot of things. <laughs> but, and so along those 4,000 lines of policy, we support some of those policies are driven exporting services that we integrate with and um, external projects. So onto the solutions I was gonna tell you about. So one of the things we've come up with, um, found a need for it was having service accounts. So we, there's the, our problem was we needed a way to manage services 
that connect our dogs differently than people because a person has metadata about them we track of interesting things like their ethnicity or their employer. I don't know if they like chocolate or not, things like that. Services don't really care about chocolate. And so we don't, and we don't really care about tracking much metadata on them. And if we did, we want to track different metadata about them. Also, services lack agency. They always are performing a task for some, for some person in the end. And finally, a, a person can, can own data. A service doesn't typically own data. I mean, excluding internal state data, of course. So anyway, it, it'd be nice to be able to differentiate between a user that's actually a service versus one that's a human. So IROTS has ability to create custom account types. So, and this is managed through the token system under the user type namespace. So to, to create a new account type, you, you can use iAdmin like this, iAdmin AT user type and account name and description if you want. And then you can use rule logic to, different, to, to differentiate the behavior allowed for that account type. There are a few limitations for this though. Accounts cannot be given admin privileges. Sorry, these custom accounts. For instance, you, a custom account cannot proxy for a user, another user. Also, uh, you cannot create an account type that acts like a group. So we use this to create a service, a, a service type account called service. And you can just use, if you wanted to create a service, you can just create using the um, I make user. Um, and then we've set up some policies in, in our, our logic for like serv our service accounts don't have home or trash collections and they don't belong to the public group. And um, at some point we plan to make it so that when a David object is created by a service, it's owned by the user invoking the service. Now, um, I, 4.2.12, 4.2.8 does, but 4.2.12 doesn't uh, work very well with the service accounts. Uh, iAdmin make user doesn't recognize um, custom accounts. Actually, it complains. It says that's not a valid account type. Good. So some weaknesses with the solution. Um, the big one is a service account can't proxy for a user. You may not want that. that sometimes it's nice to be able to do that because uh, if they can proxy for your user, you can uh, track user actions for provenance purposes, uh, things like that. But also, uh, the, it does limit us because users must explicitly grant the service access to your That may be something you want because to protect your security, but sometimes you may not want that. And also, the ownership of the data generated by, through the service um, is not well defined. So feature request would be from, from me to I, um, IROD's people is do we get a built-in service account type that's able to proxy for user or add a you know, pep logic to be able to control whether an account type has the ability to proxy? So on to the next problem, data residency. So with Cybers, we have uh, several, I mean, different types of storage requirements. So we have general purpose ones that apply to everyone except people with custom projects and custom service uh, storage requirements. We have project specific ones, uh, and we also have service specific storage requirements. So some of our uh, projects provide their own storage server to us. So they buy the hardware and they uh, we host it for them. But their intent is it's for their data and no one else's. Uh, one of our one of our services is, um, provides G GPU based computation, and it wants to it wants the data co located on the it wants it to store it uses storage co located with the GPUs. So for a pro, uh, so basically we want, that's a resource server. And if a service or project wants to use this service, it needs its data stored on that server. So a project can subscribe to that service and the data to be hosted there. Um, also for the remaining data, this is just our general data. We want copies at both the University of Arizona and at TAC. That's because uh, our users can run analyses at both at either location or both. And it's nice to have data fairly close to the computation. Also at services, we have extra offsite backups of everything. 
So the first step in uh, solving data, data residency problem is determining, well, organizing our resources. So for the general storage, uh, we decided we wanted, we'd have two resource servers, excuse me, two resources that are root level. And then we have bidirectional asynchronous replication between them. And that's because um, we took, went by uh, asynchronous instead of synchronous because synchronous uh, replication, the degraded transfers or update, excuse me, data ingest too much. So user would upload a file, they have to wait for the data to go here and then University of Arizona and then wait for it to be replicated to TAC, which sometimes can be slow. And we decided that the, the with uh, the asynchronous time though, when small window of time when there's only one copy of the file, it's it's a acceptable risk for data loss. So on the for the on the project and server side, we either the project or service has a storage server, which we configured as a resource server, and we provide a wrap that in a single storage resource, and then we in front of that we set a single pass through root resource, which is how they'd access it, and that's following um, recommended practice. So choosing where to store a new data object, well, I mean, we use the PEP AC set resource scheme for create. Um, my first attempt a long time ago was worked out. I mean, it worked, but it was, it didn't, it had lots of weaknesses. And that was, I just basically hard coded the paths into the rule logic and then used if the else tree to get, decide where it goes. Uh, Weak, very weak. I mean, as you can guess, the weaknesses of this with lots of repeated code. Um, it becomes order independent. So if you have, this is kind of strange concoction, but you have a project which has their resource server, then they have a sub project which has its second resource server that they want to go to. And we do have one situation like similar to that. Uh, you need to make sure the sub projects comes before the actual project in the code. Otherwise, it will be ignored. Uh, Finally, if you add a new project, you have to redeploy your rules. And we have 40 resource servers, and it's annoying to redeploy to 40 servers. So a better approach, which you can get probably guess, is to use ABUs. So you attach an ABU to a resource that associates a project path with it. And our, we chose the ABU hosted collection. And this has the benefits. No repeated code. If you want to add a, add a new project, you just attach a new ABU and it works. I mean, it also means there's, you don't have to redeploy code. Also, um, it's order independent. And as Jason Capasi says, configuration, not code. Now, uh, this also a problem, I mean, a similar problem. So once a data, data object's created, where, where do you choose to replicate? How do you decide where to replicate it? So it's, I mean, we solve it a similar way. You know, we attach an ABU. This time we attach it to the primary resource. So this is the, the resource where the original copy of the data are up, is reside. And we say, we had assign the replica resource to that ABU. So that, I mean, because that's how we um, are, Policy is it says if we have a resource server that's at U of A and one at TAC, and we just make them each other, we make each one a primary resource, and it, excuse me, we attach an ABU to each one of them that associates the other one as the replica for it. And then we use uh, rule logic to, to redetermine where to go using the ABUs. And the AC set resource scheme for REPL is the PEP we use. As I said, it's similar logic, but with uh, one caveat. If the, not every, since not all data are replicated between resources, um, projects, particularly project ones and uh, service ones, if uh, there's no replica resource ABU, we don't replicate. Now on to the next problem. So downloading, loading a large set of small files. So let's pretend a user needs to download multiple terabytes of data consisting of, you know, several hundred thousand files. 
Now, when you, as you guys all know, downloading a set of small files takes a lot longer than downloading some single large file that's the same volume of data. So if, an example, uh, downloading one, one gigabyte file takes about 13 seconds on my laptop. Downloading a thousand one megabyte files takes 471 seconds, so 36 times longer. I mean, this is not an IROD's problem. This is a general uh, problem, but IROD's also has. So common solutions for this are use a tar pipe. So the weakness of that is if the all the files concatenated together get really large, um, the transfer can be problematic due to network issues or cache overruns, things like that. So one solution is to use tar and split. So you first you tar up all the files and you pipe it through the split command and it splits it into large chunks, like for instance, 100 gigabytes. And then you transfer each of the 100 gigabytes and then re, you know, rejoin them all back together on the other side and uh, split it up, split apart. Uh, so IRODS has similar solution to that. I mean, so the, similar to the tar pipe part, you can use IBUN. You can, you know, use IBUN, creates, takes your data on the server, creates a single file from it, then you can use IGET to download it and pipe through tar. Okay, I'm nearly done. So weaknesses with this, if data sets distribute across multiple servers, IBUN replicates the data to a single server, which could first, and that can be slow. Also, it still has the very large file transfer problem. Now, there's another solution similar to the tar split. And this would be to, on each resource server, run tar split, use iREG to register the chunks in to iRODs, and then use I get to download all the chunks and then redo, put everything back together on the, on the client side. And we put together something similar that I, it requires the admin user to, to chunk the data right now. An example was we a user full project downloaded a hundred terabyte data set um, in a little over two days. Uh, you could also do this. You could uh, potentially you could get rid of the admin user by creating a rule logic that would handle the chunking on the server side. That the uh, users could use I wrote rule to call to chunk the data before downloading. Um, finally, interest group. So I'd like to propose the interest group, an interest group uh, goal would be to develop and document best practices, define new features, maybe define new features for IRODs, um, and be focused on solving administrative problems mainly and possible topic discussion format. It's tended to fit between what IROD's chat does right now and what TriRODs tri does. And if you're interested in this, uh, join me today for a uh, birds of a feather at lunch. That's it. Do we have any questions for Tony? Okay. Uh, regarding the administration uh, interest group, I think John Constable last year had some thoughts about that. I don't know if you could contact him. He's, I think, in uh, Sanger Institute in England. Yeah, I'm, I've talked to him about it. Or okay. He's interested in and has lots, he has lots of ideas, of course. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, in your, you spoke about shifting to using metadata instead of like having this large if else branch ladder, right? What, like, did you see any changes in performance in that shift? Did it, did it performance improve or did it, you know, not improve? Was it kind of the same? I felt it slightly improved performance, actually. Any other questions from anyone? Uh, 
Not very often. <laughs> so no, yeah, it hasn't had a big impact on it, but it is, I mean, it is more, the response time when a new one arises is a lot faster than uh, otherwise. Just one last thing. You mentioned the use of, you introduce um, new tokens into the system, which I, did, I was not aware that people even use that facility. So uh, it would be, I think it would be good if, we had an issue or a place to talk about that. So we, because for all we know, RISE admin, RISE user, and group admin are all the types that people use. And so if that's something you're leveraging, we need to know that so that we can continue to support that kind of capability. Okay. All right. Okay, yeah, a uh, question from uh, Sanger. Um, did you ever face issues with two replicas having different checksums? Yes. Uh, we often, well, I mean, two different types of checks like MD5 on one and SHA, you know, 256 on the other. Or are they talking like two different checks on values? We've experienced both. I'm wondering what the question is in order to. Oh, I mean, yeah, but the, the files were different. So that it was some sort of a replication issue. So or, but it's, you can compare, you, well, using actual data, I mean, the actual checksum versus what's in the ICAT and figure out which one's good and resolve it. All right. Thanks, Tony.